Hello and welcome to another episode of the Noise Podcast. Today, Will Marshall, he of Metal Hammer and literally every other UK magazine and publication known to man, and I review the new Conjurer album, uh, which is out July 1st on Nuclear Blast. It's called Pathos. It's fucking sick. You should check it out. At the end of the podcast, I also interview Brady Deep Rose from the band, who's guitar and vocals. He's fantastic, he's really thoughtful, he's really interesting, and we had a fantastic interview talking about the construction of the album and songwriting in general. Make sure you also follow us on Noise uh, Podcast on Twitter, at Noise UK on Twitter as well. Um, Follow us on YouTube at Noise UK, subscribe to us, comment, all that good stuff. All right, enjoy the podcast. Hello, welcome to another episode of the Noise Podcast. I'm once again joined by the man with many jobs, Will Marshall. How are you, Will? Love treating you okay? Yeah, yeah, it's going pretty good at the moment, keeping busy as ever yourself. Yeah, I can't can't complain apart from the fact that things are approaching sort of like echoing like sort of Icarus temperatures, like sort of like the second half of that Greek tile when he's just now was deep away from just everything melting. That's what yeah. that's what it feels like currently. How are things down in London? I imagine it's just chaotic at the minute with the trains and everything as well. I haven't left the house. <laughs> it's... That's the best response. That's the best way to handle this. Yeah, you know, literally, we saw all the train strikes were happening. I went, well, I'm not leaving the city. That's fine. And then they announced the tube strikes were happening. I went, well, fuck it. I'm not even leaving the flat. So I've yeah. bait, we've we've all turned around and told our office like we're not coming in this week. See you in a fortnight. <laughs> Honestly, I don't. I don't blame you at all. Don't blame me the slightest. Everything you can do there without hassle can be done. Residing in your own, residing in your own flat, you could just sort of like break out once in a while to do the shopping, and maybe just get some fresh air for like fifteen minutes, and then sort of head back in. I, that is absolutely the way that things should be done. Yeah. Absolutely the way things should be done. And I can listen to Conjurer here. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, so we are going to be talking about the the new Conjurer record today, um, due to be released on July first. So at the time recording today is. Um, the 22nd of June, uh, via Nuclear Blast, recorded by and produced with Will Putney, which is in itself a seal of approval across the industry. Um, You mentioned to me off air, Will, that you've been sitting on this record since May. So with what is coming close to about six weeks worth of experience in comparison to my five days, I'm going to start with you. What are your... What are your thoughts on this album in terms of over the length of time that you've heard it? Has it got staying power with you so far? Without delving in track by track, what have been your general impressions and your relationship with this album um, between between May and now? All right, so when I first got it, I was obviously ludicrously excited because I fucking love Conjurer. Like, Maya was... Maya is and (laughs) remains the best extreme metal debut of the past 10 years. So naturally, Woo! like big boy take, starting off early. It's true though. It's true. Maya was incredible. It still is, and it, that hand that holds up four years down the line as vital as it was when it came out. Maya, when I first heard it, I wasn't sure. I was like, I think it's as good as Maya. But Pathos. Now I've sat with it for six weeks and really got to like sit with it listen to it lots there's i think it's got staying power purely because you need to listen to it a lot like maya wasn't a simple album pathos is all that and more it needs more listens it needs more time it's got more going on it's a it's like it's a massive sonic expansion it's not maya part two which is the best thing like one of the best things about it is they've not said let's just make maya again they've said let's do something completely different or at the very least, take the core DNA that is Conjurer. I I think this album's fucking incredible. I think, I think I, I think it succeeds Maya as their best album. I think they really have gone up a level with this. You know, I I, I think it's one of the contenders for the album of the year for me already. Um, it's I, it's, yeah. it's 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 sensational. Now I want to play before I get into sort of thoughts and track by track stuff. I want to play um, a game. 
I want you to imagine that I am a die-hard non-journalist conjurer fan, and I've saw you from across a pub somewhere at some death metal gig where we both had our nose put out of joints. We just happen to be next to each other at the bar, and I've turned around to you. You've heard the new Kundra album, haven't you? And you go, yes. And I go, all right, how does it compare to Maya? What are the differences? Tell me about it. Now, I know nothing about this album. What would you say to me? All right. Maya has got, like, Maya is riffs. Like, it's got all of the big riffs all of the time. Pathos still has all the big riffs, but it's moodier. It's more atmospheric. It's it's somehow like it's darker it's it get it goes to even darker places than maya did and it does it in but it does it all in the same way that you'll recognize so like maya very immediate whereas with pathos you'll sit with it a bit longer and it'll really stick in your head like it, it it's like i say it's moodier it's like there's more atmosphere but they still know how to drop the big riff when they need to or when they want to ultimately yeah, I would, I would break breaking away from my impersonation of a random stranger for a second. Um, I, I would agree with that. I think one of the one of the one of the key sort of tropes of this album, the key motifs of this record, listening through through it over the last few days, is its ability to drop on a dime between the incredibly gutturally heavy and the melancholy and transcendent. Now. Over the last few years, this appears to be a growing trend in extreme metal, that juxtaposition, that darkness, that light. Um, and we've seen bands try this in varying degrees of success. And I'd say that there's lots of bands that are very good at this in varying genres, like from Svalbard to Merle, um, obviously Conjure included in this. And there are some bands where that feels a little bit forced, the transitions are a little bit tougher. How do you how do you write this band's ability to sort of switch between them? Because for me, that's a personal personal highlight. Looking generally at the album, I think they're fucking seamless. Like it's it's so when it when it happens immediately, it's never jarring. And sometimes it'll unfold over a song, and you'll get to the end, and you're like, you're in such a different place that you started, and you didn't even notice. So I I think they're fucking great at it. I genuinely think they are like. They're like like you say, they're up there with the Svalbards and the Merles of, of the world in managing that juxtaposition of darkness, light, so well. I don't think there's necessarily much light in Conjurer. Um, emotionally, they're much more like anguished, melancholy, it's generally quite negative. But they still balance that sort of quieter or more brooding moments with, like you say, this death metal, post metal, sludge, black metal, all these crushing extremes uh, really, really well. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would I would agree. And and listen listen to this. This is one of those extreme metal albums where extreme metal as a banner term is actually very appropriate because I would struggle to place this in individual subgenres. I would suggest that this at times flits doom and sludge and black metal and little bits of old school death metal and all these other varieties. Um, would you would you agree with that, or maybe am I getting my um, my Wikipedia entries mixed up here? No, I think you're spot on. I think even you know even on their debut, they had that ability. But what what happened with Maya was you'd listen to it, and you'd be like, "That's a doom riff. That's a black metal riff. That's a yeah. death metal breakdown. That's a post metal like crescendo." But it would still all hang together nicely. It would still hang together well. With Pathos, it's like, it's, you know, you'll still get flickers here and there. But it is, like you say, is this amalgamation of genres that's done so well that if you if, if someone said to me, what genre are Conjurer? I'm just going to tell you they're an extreme metal band. There's no other way of describing what they do. Yeah, I, I, would, I would absolutely completely agree with that. I think, um, and I think that's a good thing. I think that's going to help them out moving forward. And and we've both had conversations with the band members in recent days, and it, I get the impression, well, Brady said this very candidly, that if they don't think that it's any good, they're not going to write anything. And the, that versatility that they really approach all their records with, especially the, obviously these 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 first two being the evidence of that, is really going to lend itself to this. So when we when we sort of dive into the album, opening it dwells. 
and the follow-up rots. It dwells is about as fantastic as an opener and a record I've heard this so far this year. It's gruesome, emotive, somewhat melancholy, and it, it talks about... So stylistically, you're already getting that vibe that we're talking about, that juxtaposition, that darkness, that light, because in the same sense of, of being able to compare it to sort of doom and sludge metal bands and things like that, I was thinking, well, it sounds a little bit like Death Haven, a little bit like Raul Tomasi. Where do you sit with this first song? It dwells. So this first song, um, as a sort of a bit of fluff about this, if you cast your mind back to June 2021, so this mm. album was actually finished in March last year. It was ready. The Masters, they had the Masters. They, they played the download pilot and they opened with an as yet untitled, or at least publicly untitled song. That song was It Dwells. So this song has been being played live since June of 2021. So I was effectively one of however many thousand people stood in front of that crowd going, what the fuck? Conjurer, for the first time in two years, and I don't know what this song is. You know, it's not off the EP. It's not off the debut. But what it does do... And when I was talking to Connor earlier, he 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 said it really succinctly. Actually, he they call this the band in a song. So this it dwells does everything that Conjurer do in one song. So there's no other song on Pathos that does this. It does every single genre that they span, and it condenses that. I say condenses. It's like what was it seven minutes twenty seconds? It's not for that condensed. <laughs> yeah. But like that, that's that's pretty average for Conjurer. You know, it, 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 it melds them, let's say, is a, maybe a better phrase, into yeah. this one song. So It Dwells, in short, rules. Like, It Dwells, It Rules. It's a fantastic opening song. And it's... But that's like... It's not even the best song on here, but it's no, amazing. It's, no, it is, it, is, it is terrific. It's epic and dark and huge. And it's kind of like an overture... You know, in the sense that it kind of gives like a hint of these wider themes that are going to appear later. And it's sort of like an appetizer of sorts. But obviously, as you mentioned, how many appetizers are seven minutes long in terms of music? You know, um, it's just it's virtually impossible. But yeah, it, 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 it's it's a tremendous opening. And we get we get rot, which is at the start is slow lumbering and has this like early like if Mastodon were a doom band kind of riff. Yeah. In the final third really heavy at the conclusion that that breakdown with the guitar slide like will oh my god <laughs> the conclusion of it's, rot yeah. it's just fucking sensational talk to me about this rot rot is really fucking ugly and i mean that as a compliment which is <laughs> which is obviously an extreme is in, in metal it is but anywhere else yeah 100 percent. it's so what again what's quite interesting about these is thematically it dwells and rot are the same so it dwells is themed around like fear and anxiety and how that manifests in in the mind and like how you experience it. Mm. Rot flips that perspective. It's giving a voice to that fear and anxiety, which is why That's it's nice. this is why, like I say, it's it's this ugly, dissonant and he like obviously it's heavy. Like it's this lurking beast, and then you have got Dan's vocals and Dan's vocals when they come in, they oh, they just sound evil. Like he's already like got these brilliant gutturals, but it's, you know when he, you know what I mean when I say like his voice, like his vocals sound wet. Yeah, yeah. They sound a bit. They sound like wet. They sound like they're just from dragged from the <clears throat> bowels of hell when this song opens. <coughs> it's yeah, and then that breakdown at the end. Oh, fucking hell. <laughs> yeah, if if you're a conjurer fan and you said you know it's not just riffs. And I was initially like a little bit perturbed, like, hold on a minute, but I love riffs. Um, please tell me the riffs are still there. Don't worry, listener. The riffs are still there. Like, oh, the yeah. riffs are here. The riffs are here to stay. The riffs don't leave. There's just like momentary distractions from the riffs that are quite nice. And then we go right back to the riffs. Don't worry, the riffs are here. Um, big, big fan. Um, and then we get all you can, all you will remember, which is one of the first songs where I think, oh my God, that's beautiful. That's the first time I thought that thought that this out in the album. That opening sort of like that transition from the staccato riffs, this beautiful section of melody. And it feels like for once, I say for once, but like the first time in this album where I can actually hear the band maturing. It feels like through this song, or at least I can hear evidence of maturity in this song for the first time, really, in the album. You know, they've they've punched you in the throat and they're the sort of 
sort of taking that away a little bit. This is a really terrific, a very complete song. The blend of the backing vocals with the screams here. Yeah. Really nice vocal juxtaposition mixing in with the actual riff work. Um, big fan of this. And then we've got that um, Svalbard type crescendo of like blast beats near the end. Yes. As I things wanted appear to, to be yeah. moving towards the end. Yeah. Talk to me about this. So I wanted to sort of, again talk about all you will remember as a whole. Um, so we we yeah, opened. It's got like these this like clean passage or these like more cleanly sung vocals, which Conjurer, Conjurer, have never done. And I'm yes. emphasizing Conjurer because as as you may um, as you may know as listeners may or may not know, in 2019 some members of Conjurer and a member of the, uh, members of the post rock band Pine created. Um, a one-off project that's no longer a one-off, um, I hope, uh, called Curse These Metal Hands. And Curse These Metal Hands, so Pine and Conjurer are both very emotionally driven, very negative, emotionally driven bands. Curse yeah. These Metal Hands, um, I've seen it described as about 50% alcohol because essentially <laughs> Curse These Metal Hands is an atmospheric post-metal between those two bands that celebrates friendship through extreme metal. Oh, that's so wholesome. And oh. first of all, the record itself, four songs, half an hour. You owe it to yourself to hear it. All you will remember has Kirstie's Metal Hands in it. Like that, that they first experiment with those cleanly song vocals through that project. They're in here. You know, there's elements of that sort of ex- expansive. Conjurer have always been expansive, but it's it's in Curse's Metal Hands. It's a little different. It's a little more scenic, almost, if that kind of makes sense. Like there's these like yeah. scenic picturesque. expanses. Yeah, picturesque, almost like open, like riffs and chords. And I, I this this is one of my right now as as of recording. This is one of my two favorite songs on the album. And then, yeah, we get into this beautiful blackened crescendo that's, again, and then we've got this, and they've got this poem um, that's actually recorded as like a spoken word again. Nothing they've ever done before over the top. So, yeah, this is Conjurer basically going, we've kicked the door off, and now you're going to see what we can do. And it just, and again, this is like, here we go, uh, 7 minutes 39, seven, 7 minutes 40 practically, of just epic, extreme metal that goes touches on so many different things. But that final crescendo is absolutely gorgeous. Yeah, I, I would agree. It's, it's truly, truly beautiful. And as well, like we're seeing that the, this band have touched on, I would say, more of a prog rock element in terms of the length of the songs, the complexity, the dexterity is taken a step forward. I mean, there's six songs on here over six minutes long. There's only two songs of five minutes and below. And one of them, one of them's that uh, two and a half minute song, uh, Suffer Alone, where they, they just wrote, just they wanted to change a pace on the record. And the rest of it is just this massive expanse of material. Um, I think I think that alone is, is, is a massive achievement. I know, I know you've delved, um, delved into prog at times uh, and, and sort of you have a, not a, a, an interesting relationship with prog metal overall. I think you love a lot of certain sections of it and some of the you've been less keen on. Um, where do you sit with the expansive direction that the Conjurer have taken on this record? Fucking adore it. Like straight up adore it. It's because for me, a lot of, so my issue with prog as like prog metal, progressive metal comes in the incessantly weirdly, weirdly, overly complicated just essentially fucks around and goes nowhere. Whereas Conjurer, they employ that kind of expansiveness and that technicality and that progressive in such a way, but they may, but it's not the main thing. It's not done for its own sake. It's employed to serve the narrative of the song, of what they're doing in that moment. So Conjurer have always had a level of expansion, expanse to their songs. This dials it up, and I'm very, very much here for it because that 50 minute runtime does not feel like it. And I honestly think 
that the record starts off incredibly strong and is consistent all the way through till the 7 minute 37 mark of Cracks in the Pyre, the final song, when it ends. Like, it's just, it's just constant, constantly incredible. I would, agree, I would agree. I think the reason that I brought it to the prog metal section now is because I felt like the opening of Basilisk with that clean opening, that layered clean, and then also returning to those clean um, riffs running under like the layers of these toxic sort of chords that are going on later when it gets a little bit heavier. He's really some of the first time where I felt like, all right, these are like prog metal tropes here. Like I would expect to hear this um, almost an Opeth record. Do you know what I mean? That kind of slow building expanse that kind of leads to this final and massive sort of sort of central figurine and i've got to say i thoroughly thoroughly enjoyed it what are your thoughts on basilisk basilisk is yeah again i really really like those bits i really love the way that it builds through that and then but i have to say as much as i enjoy that my favorite bit because i'm a sucker for it comes just after the four and a half minute mark of this near five and a half minute song where, as we've said before, Conjurer basically just go, we're going to drop the riff now. Oh, the China. Oh, <laughs> yes. Absolutely disgusting breakdown that just hits out of nowhere like a sledgehammer. Like It's just monumental. It's this humongous, really slow, sludgy behemoth of a breakdown, and I adore it. That I think I that, that is what that is what I would say is to people who were maybe unsure of it, is like, if you can get like so you'll enjoy like the riffs are still here, even even on a track like Basilisk where they play with prog and they play with that you know tropes that you might expect like you say to see more in like Opeth even, even like modern Opeth. At the end of it, they're still just going to absolutely drop the riff on you. So yeah. you're still uh, going to have a point where you're just like, oh, okay, I know where I am. I'm in a Conjurer album and I'm being <laughs> mauled. Yeah, I love that. It's like a rings on the table situation. So for me, there's like, there's this really famous story when Miami recruited LeBron James. Uh, Sam talks about basketball. You're going to have to just deal with it for a second. <laughs> but bottom line, um, Pat Riley, who um, worked for the Lakers and then worked for the Knicks and Miami, really successful basketball career as an executive. Anyway, tries to get LeBron James to play for the Miami Heat. And he's opening his opening pitch to LeBron. He's not to say a word. He walks in, LeBron sits down, welcomes the meeting, and Pat Riley takes out his each championship ring he's won his entire career and just lays them on the table in front of LeBron James, who has at that point in his career zero championship rings and just says, if you want to come here, if you want to win type of thing, this is what we do. And and that was it, really. Like, it was just like, where would you turn around and say, you know what, fuck off, I don't fancy winning basketball games as a career as a basketball player. That's just really anti-brand. Um, and leads to say LeBron played in Miami. So this is this is what it feels like in that kind of thing. Like, it's like, a, this is who we are. This is what we do. You can go anywhere else you like, but if you're going to come here, you're going to hear riffs. It's rings on the table. And that's 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 what it feels like to me. And I, and I, and I still really love that they chose the end of a prog metal album to just be like, hit the China, let's just completely mess up their day and just be like, what, what is going on? Well, that's SpongeBob meme where he's part K fan and he's just sort of spinning his head around. I was like, yeah, what? Yeah, so there are some yeah. really fucking confused Tesseract fans at that point just going like, what? <laughs> I'd sign up for this. Uh, oh. Just absolutely sensational. Um, but and then, then it could, yeah. go on, sorry, you know, after you, after you. I say, but then basilisk drops into and i am going to say this this is my favorite song on the album those years yeah. condemned holy oh, fuck it's 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 hard to describe this one other than just like this is a it's the longest song on the album at nearly eight minutes but b it's it's like it packs so much in like it's got this emotional heft to it like from that opening sort of build through to like there's a there's a there's like that crescendo and then it just hits with those dual vocal like the dual vocals that is like their trademark or one of their many. It's incredible, like the the sheer emotion that they bring to bear on that song, in like in those moments, is like nothing, like nothing you'll hear anywhere else outside of Conjurer, and. It actually, in some ways, you remember Hollow off Maya. Yeah, true. You know when, yeah, you know when that massive emotional like high hits for the chorus. Mm. This is like this song, 
like that level of emotional turmoil and like what's the word is it's almost like yearning like that level of emo like yearning and constant and like morose kind of emotion it's, it's through the whole song i adore it it's it's no i completely agree with you i think this is the highlight of the album um because i had like i thought this was like four different songs at various points of this record at various points of this song i was just just my thoughts in general i was like this does a lot this is emotional this is pain ridden feels really cathartic love the little pause before the vocals kick in that's really nice oh a change of rhythm mid transition how nice complex here this is feeling like it's a black metal song now um and then i was like this doesn't feel like a black metal song anyway this feels this feels like an encyclopedic look of several metal subgenres all at once and then near the conclusion i was like this is like a masterpiece this is just changing and twisting and turning overall and i literally wrote i'm going to read this word for word from my notes here in caps the riff at the conclusion of this oh my god and then full stop another sentence the riff after the riff at the conclusion of this there's like a little bit <laughs> there's a bit when i thought this is like the final thing that they were doing and then it paused and it went into something even better it was just unbelievable it's like like sort of like a like one of those like russian dolls when he just yeah. seems to get bigger and bigger and bigger and there's just extra levels and extra levels so oh you thought this was over oh, here's another one and here's another one um at this point i'm starting to think that this is like a a defining album of the year type of situation and really sort of a um a nice time stamp for where metal is moving and i have this conversation all the time over the years that we've done the podcast and i'll sort of relay this to you as well the when we when we were growing up like i say we me, me and you was on the same generation those sort of late 90s early 2000s that type of stuff sort of growing up whatever um the floor for what it what you need to be to be a metal band but the minimum level of talent you needed to have to be a great metal musician has slowly, slowly raised as the years have gone on. Whereas now, the floor, the minimum requirement you have to be to be a great metal musician is what I would have considered the ceiling to be like 15 years ago. Do you know what I mean? Like it is completely flipped on its head. Do you agree with that? Because listening to records like this, I'm like, not only is this amazing, but how is this even possible from a songwriting standpoint? Yeah, I, I get that. And what's really interesting is that um, it comes part of it comes back to the fact that the they're perfectionists so there's and I, I checked this with connor and it is it's roughly true in terms of timing that little like jangly acoustic intro to it dwells it's no more than about 30 seconds right yeah it took them yeah. two hours to write like two <laughs> two hours of back and forth between all four members till they were all happy with it because what, what he was saying what they do is that it's not they're not gonna if like like you said like Brady said to you if they if they're not gonna write it if they don't or they're not gonna put it out if they don't think it's good yeah yeah but what Connor was saying is that all four of them need to agree so if they've got three of them and one person says I'm not quite happy with this they'll keep working and until they're sure that they've exhausted every single possibility they can for that segment either during that time they perfect it and that or perfect it for those you know the four of them and that final person goes yes i'm happy with this now and they all agree or they get to the end of that and the other person goes it's still not quite there for me but we've tried everything like so in term it's not just in terms of like a ceiling of or like a floor of, of talent it's part of what makes conjurer so incredible is their sheer bloody mindedness like and unwillingness to create songs that aren't amazing <laughs> like because exactly, you know they've, yeah. they've, they've said like their their impetus is to make the stuff they the want to hear like... so like like every band does they all want to hear that they make they make this they want to hear but that floor and ceiling I, I i genuinely do think you can be a great or you can be a very good simplistic metal band I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with that. You can still write big tunes. You can still get famous. Of Five Flavor Fruit Punch are an ex excellent example of this. But if you want to be a fantastic metal band, you not only need to take what's been done, and you don't have to be the most technically proficient, but you need to build on it in some way. Yeah, Even you if have you're to playing some simple. Forward. Definitely, definitely. Let's take, and I know you've talked about it in the past, and I know it's kind of wrong to bring it up in this discussion potentially, but Bleed From Within, the new Bleed From Within album, Shrine. 
Yeah, yeah. A lot of the ingredients already exist out in the world. People have been mm-hmm. doing it for years, but it's what they've mm-hmm. done with it. And I think that's true of Conjurer too, is it's not just... Because like all of these subgenres they amalgamate, they exist. Black Metal's existed since the, you know, the 90s or whatever. Thrash has existed for 30, 40 years at this point. Yeah. Doom has existed since the 60s, you know? But it's what they do with it. It's that it's that songwriting intelligence. I think that's what's not just the talent, I think that's possibly the biggest marker of the change in the last twenty years of metal is the level of songwriting intelligence and the willingness to go outside of like what you originally thought of as genre that's what's that's what's really doing it now that's what's driving the scene i think yeah i, I would agree and i think i think one of the things that's really helped this as well is the the dissonance that has existed now between the band's creative control and any record label involvement. So what you used to have in the sort of 70s, 80s, 90s is you'd sign a five record deal and they'd be like, have you got the album yet? Have you got the album yet? Have you got the album yet? You going on tour yet? You going on tour yet? And like bands like ACDC and Made and the big 80s bands, especially the new wave of British heavy metal bands, really producing like four or five albums over the course of six or seven years. And there's no room for expansion. So you end up with these eras of music that sounded incredibly similar. Like if you, if you listen to music from sort of 81 to 85, used to Maiden and Priest and, and, and sort of early Metallica. I'm not saying it's all the same. I'm not saying that at all. But there's, there's a common thread through a lot of the major players, whereas now it's a bit more expansive because I think bands are able to separate themselves, almost separate church and state a little bit between uh, what's going on at the record label and what's actually going on between the band's studios, which allows bands like Kundra to be perfectionists and work to their own deadlines and hold themselves accountable for the result of the products rather than the result of any sort of, hey, this needs to be out in three months because you need to sell some t-shirts. Um, that 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 whole dynamic has shifted and for the benefit of the benefit of better music, I think. No, a hundred percent, yeah. And it means that you know, to sort of bring it you know onto the songs themselves, it means we get songs where they'll craft these long winded it's not long winded, but like long form sort of opuses like those years condemned, and then they'll drop a two minute forty suffer alone which by this album stands is practically you suffer you know (laughs) yeah and then they'll follow it up with two more like seven plus or seven near seven and then seven and a half minute songs like and i just want to briefly like talk about cracks in the pyre yeah of course because as a closer for an album we've already had like a near perfect opener in it dwells and rot and then to close it with cracks in the pyre which was the third and final single as well which i think is a really interesting move as well yeah brave it's like, so thematically, it's it's about the afterlife and death, from what I gather. And it feels like a summation of everything that's been coming before it, you know, in terms of the album. It's not, and it doesn't really round things off in a, on a positive note, because again, I don't think that's what Conjurer are about. I think it it, it rounds it off on a, on a note of catharsis of, we've exercised all of this now. We've spent, you know four years between albums we didn't want to take this long but it's given us this time to be perfectionists although what what's interesting is um is that not only did you have like you said the record labels knocking at doors beforehand but they never intended to take four years to make a record no. so no. from what they've probably said to you as well is it's like they were going to be like we're going to tour we're going to release Maya, tour for a year get right in again 2020 was going to be a year off but they kept getting through these mad tour offers because Maya just Maya went stratospheric. You know, it was like yeah, yeah. It blew up so much that they got the most incredible tours, and they were just like, we can't turn these down. It took a global pandemic to put Conjurer back in writing. <laughs> yeah, because they don't yeah. write on the road, like, and that that would never have happened forty years ago. It would have been like, you can't tour for four years. Or, you know, it wouldn't be like, you can't tour for two years and then take a year to write. The fuck are you on? It's like, we need a new album six months ago. That yeah. length of time. And the willingness of fans to wait that, even in the internet age, even in the age of the internet, the willingness of fans to go, I will wait four years for a new Conjurer album because I know it's going to knock my socks off. Yeah, I would, I would, I would agree. I would, I would agree with that. I think 
the fan relationship with, with with musicians is entirely adjusted as well. And I think we're, we're, all, we're all for the benefit of that. We're actually closer to the artists. We figure out more what's going on. It's, it is, you're right, for the benefit of the record, because this is a special release. Um, I'd feel wrong if I didn't spend at least just 20 seconds talking about how it, the opening riff to In Your Wake made me want to commit a violent crime. Um, <laughs> the, because what I loved about it is that it spent 80, 80 to 90% of this record is beauty and dexterity, and this is the complete reverse. And they were just like, do you want to just play that really cool riff that sounds really cool? That's yeah. like just really bouncy and griffy and groovy. And I'm like, yes, this is absolutely fantastic. Get your elbows going. It's just... Yeah. It's, it's the sound of a band going we've just we've just finished one of the greatest songs we've ever written one of the best songs that's going to one of the probably top 20 songs that's going to come out this year because there's going to be there's some absolute corpus possibly probably top 10 let's be honest songs that's come out this year and let's follow it with the dirtiest sludgiest riff on the entire album just because we <laughs> fucking feel like it here you Absol go abs bash absolutely. this amp over your head you know <laughs> Yeah, honestly, I completely agree with you. It's 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 a phenomenal riff. Uh, it's a brilliant song, and again, that speaks to that versatility. Um, because I, like many listeners now, have attention deficit disorder when it comes to metal, and I love that I'm being constantly pulled in different directions. I love that I'm being thrown different genres as we're going along. I love that this is not a challenge to listen to, but it is. Um, I don't know how to describe it? It's not a challenge, but it is sort of like demanding of a listener in the sense that. Um, you've got a lot to sort of take on and I love that. I love albums that, that make me do that and I think having that, having those two tracks of Alone in Your Wake, that do feel like the band are taking a fucking breather for like two songs but um, back into the clean, into the heavy, that type of stuff and then finishing like you mentioned on Cracks in the Pyre which is just this beautiful beautiful song um the scream at the pause the figure with the sliding chords at like about five six minutes in mimics with the octaves at the end the atmospheric album atmospheric ending bringing it all together reminding you that once again these are a band capable of just huge soundscapes and, and, and all this all this massive galactic size um riff work it's just a real real achievement yeah and now the course, absolutely sorry. In, so the absolutely insane thing is right this album is this good, right? It's album number two. Yeah. I, th I think it's, yeah, it's so easy to lose sight of the fact that this is a band on their second album. Second. Mm -hmm. Like, how usually high the is second the album ceiling? Season, yeah, usually the sophomore album, there's a classic dip there after the debut, and then the third album tends to be where they find, like, their niche, their classic sound. Like, if you follow metal stereotypes, this should be, like, in five years, we could be saying that this is a, this is this is the worst of the three stereotypically, which is incredible to think about as well. Um, so, looking forward, we talked about top twenty, top ten, top ten songs. All right, it's six months from now. It's the twenty third of December. You're presumably deliberating over your album of the year list. If you haven't already by that point, you're changing things, you're chopping things, you're having arguments. So with December, yourself. knock two months off that, and that's when I'll be turning my first one. In. <laughs> uh, so, all right, it's, it's Halloween in four months and you're like, oh, essentially, yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Obviously, you don't know what's coming. You don't know what the next six months is going to sound like. Are you happy to say that this is going to comfortably be a top 10 or even top seven to five album for you? Where is it going to sit by Christmas? I think right now it's top five. Okay. It won't be exiting the top 10. It... It could exit the top five, but no worse than the top seven, I think. I think, because the thing is, right, the, the, here's, here's just a quick, quick recap of what we've had out this year that's high on my list Venom Prison. Yep. Cult of Luna. Rollo Tomasi. Cave yep. In. Bleed from yep. Within. Yep. Oh. Like, and, and that's and that's just a brief summation of stuff that's this isn't even touching on what what we're probably gonna be talking about in a few weeks time is the fucking Ithaca record Conjurer mm -hmm. is top five Conjurer is absolutely top five right now it won't be outside of the top seven come the end of the year unless something insane happens um, like they release album number three <laughs> which won't happen absolutely categorically won't but no I, I do genuinely firmly believe this will be ensconced happily in my top 10 come 
October when I'm required to when I'll be submitting my uh, end of year lists to uh, to Metal Hammer, and I'll have a bit longer to think about it for everywhere else. So come November time, it'll probably still be there as well. Yeah, I think I think I agree with you. It's top five for me at the moment as well. Um, it's been a really good week for for my for my ears listening to Coed, Lexus on Fire, and uh, and this Conjure record has just been soul food for for my head. Oh, that's gonna be a record. Wonderful. Yeah, let, oh, let, we, we'll, we'll talk about it in person. Um, it's just phenomenal. Um, Claudia Lopez is a wizard. Anyway, um, but yes, I, I, it's top five for me. And I, I'll say, once again, I've gone into an album, it's an extreme metal album, and my stereotypical instinct going into it is, please don't let this sound like I've ever heard this before. I don't want it. I don't want extreme metal to sound like every other extreme metal record. And if it fits the blueprint, I'm immediately making decisions on how the rest of it's going to sound. And what I like about it is it doesn't do that at all. It keeps you guessing. It keeps you thinking. It's emo- it's somehow emotionally investing and also physically threatening simultaneously. Not sure yeah. how an album can actually do that. That's really, really special. Um, I'm just a big fan of this from start to finish. I do think this is a special record, both for them and for their career. Any final thoughts on Conjure before, uh, before we wrap this up? Yeah, probably... Uh, more than there should be um so you you talk about how like it's it keeps you guessing what i something connor said and that when i listened to it after he said this and i actually really agree with pick any song uh, pick any point at any song on pathos hit play within 20 30 seconds you're interested you're hooked Mm. and you want to know what's happening there's never a moment where there's nothing going on. Even in the quietest moments, they're doing something that's worth your time. It doesn't have to be the biggest stank face inducing riff on the planet. It doesn't have to be the, you know, the end of Basilisk or the opener of In Your Wake. It can be It Dwells when you get that little bit of jangly acoustic and you're like, oh, what's going to happen now? There's always something going on. They don't follow the traditional verse chorus structure. They, They have... They've, you, they've kind of toyed with it in the past, but here it feels like they don't really use it. They use repeating motifs, but they always have something that's going to keep your interest. There's always something engaging about a Conjurer album, and I think this is completely true of Pathos. Something that, something that, that again, Brady has said in previous interviews is what they wanted to do with Pathos is distill, take that roadburn sound take the sound of roadburn and distill it into something accessible so you've got bands like the utterly utterly batshit imperial triumphant or like the crushing post metal of uh, sumac and what they then do is they go well how would that sound if a bunch of kids that grew up on trivium and mastodon wrote it and gajira and they just plug it all through that and that's what Pathos is. It's an album. I think maybe that's my the way that I would summarize it. I guess is to is to is to essentially Nick Connor's phrasing. It's it's an album that channels Imperial Triumphant, Sumac, and just generally the the Roadburn Festival. If you're familiar, that it's like this celebration of extremity and progress and like avant garde experimental music, not just metal, but like alternative, like gold. Um, and then funnels it through Gajira riffs and Trivium. I think that's pathos, and it's so much more. I think as well that's a terrific advert for the band. You know, ridiculous music for the rational minded. Essentially, it's just taking all this insane stuff and then just putting it through the blender of of more con- of more contemporary modern musicians. Well, yeah. I think I think this is going to be an album that we're going to be talking about all year. I think it's definitely going to be an album we're talking about at the conclusion of the year. A very important based on our based on our schedules. Well, I want to say thank you for for coming on and discussing this album. For no doubt, there will be uh, metal albums in the near horizon. I have a feeling that we might be discussing that Ithaca Records um, in a few weeks, which is going to be exciting as well. It'll be wonderful to have you on. Um, I want to say thank you to everybody for listening. Um, keep following us on the socials at Noise Podcasts on Twitter at Noise UK on Twitter. Uh, follow us on Facebook and Instagram and YouTube, all at the Noise UK. Um, keep listening out for, for new content. Will, before we go, do you have anything to plug? Uh, phew, the bath. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
so not immediately, just to say that um, probably probably a bit heretical to do this, but in about a week's time, the new issue of Metal Hammer drops, and this, and I did the fucking coolest thing in my life, and it's in Aww. there. Fantastic. Do you hear that, kids? Will masturbating in the third, the third page of Mel Hammer. Um, everyone available for four pounds. It's incredibly cheap considering how personal that got. But no, that is a fucking fantastic achievement. I'm incredibly proud of you, man. That's wicked. Um, you, you drop me a message when that's when that's it. That's next week. Is that next Wednesday? Uh, it's sometime next week, I think, that it comes out. Yeah. Brilliant. I'll make sure I pop down to a news agent and grab myself a copy for you. That's absolutely wicked. All right. Thank you to everybody for listening. Thank you for joining us on another episode of the Noise Podcast. Thank you to Will. I'd like to say goodbye and play you guys out. Thank you. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Noise Podcast. We are here with Brady Deep Bros from Kundra, um, whose new album, um, Pathos is out on the 1st of July which is incredibly excited first of all I want to say just uh, fantastic for having um, having you over and, and and having you on to talk to us how are things how are things in the world of country at the moment yeah no thank you for having me um, I always thought it was noisy until literally like five seconds <laughs> uh, so that's good to know um, yeah good like uh, I was saying just before we, we jumped on the call um we we got to play this festival in Tasmania over the weekend, which was absolutely insane. Um, we rocked up and played to like fifteen hundred people in this massive warehouse, um, and uh, it's called Dark Mofo, and they take over this whole city of Hobart and just have like art installations and um, like there are these this massive inverted cross lit up in red just like in the middle of the harbour it's <laughs> wild like everywhere in the town just like puts red lights on the buildings and it's yeah unlike anything I've ever experienced but um so yeah well, we're like in a a bit of a weird position because like we're still kind of going out and doing insane stuff like that off the back of a record that came out four years ago really so um yeah i'm uh in a real real cool spot but um just uh eager to to get this new record out to be honest yeah so talk us talk us about the timeline there so obviously 2018 maya comes out and you get like this immediate sort of um sort of critical wave really just like an astonishing response from a band for a debut albums within within almost it seemed like months you were you were immediately sort of really respected within the genre which usually fair play to you guys obviously that tends to take a, like, take a lot of time but obviously then obviously the pandemic hits so is it is it like are we in like an awkward transitional stage now where you're actually kind of looking forward to pathos to come out almost to to put a, a full stop on the maya leg of conjurer's career is that fair to say or yeah for sure like it was it was so weird because um, we had been like gigging pretty consistently for like three or so years before Maya came out, three or four years. And we were playing like three shows a week, just absolutely everywhere we could, you know, everywhere and anywhere we could play a show, we were doing it. So um, we'd kind of like, most of the people that had, heard of us had heard of us before the record came out like I feel like we built up that kind of fan base and that like support system really organically over that time so to us it didn't really feel like anything changed I think it just kind of like continued picking up speed and we started getting offers from like people we didn't know and like um people would be approaching us for shows as opposed to the other way around. That was the only real, real big change when Maya came out. So, um, and, and kind of like in that, we had no expectations for what it was going to do. It was like, oh, you know, we love our songs. You know, we think we play well live. Let's do it. Let's do an album. Like our, our goal when we started the band was to do an album. <laughs> like that was, that was it. I know Dan was like, even happy if it didn't get properly released he was like let's do an album put out on Bandcamp and jobs are good um so for it to be so well received and to kind of like launch us on many years of touring has 
just been a little a little overwhelming to be honest um but we were like set to go we kept saying like right we need to like take a beat and like work on another record and take some time off touring and you know really focus on it and then we'd get off of another tour and we wouldn't say no and then it was just constant like we were on tour in March 2020 when like the world properly shut down um and I think if it wasn't for the pandemic we wouldn't have taken time off to properly write the record like we'd still probably be touring now it's it's wow. <clears throat> not in our nature to turn things down yeah um, so for for us like the pandemic was a chance to take some time away from the band initially and like focus on our own lives like I got married and moved out of like my mom's house for the first time in my life and um all the guys actually moved out of their parents houses over the kind of pandemic and over the last kind of year or so um and we've all kind of stepped into having a bit of a real life outside of the band and I think that has informed certainly my outlook on what we do um it's like I have this life that I is like full and complete and something that I enjoy and the band is a part of that as opposed to like my sole reason for existing is right. making music in this band and I think it just takes the pressure off a little bit um yeah just allows you to kind of enjoy doing it more and I think that has been the biggest um thing about this record it's kind of like reinvigorated my passion for doing what we do is the first time we've had new music since we started the band like the majority of Maya was written around the same time as we wrote our EP um like before we ever started playing shows in 2014 so um this is like the first time we've had new music it's like a new outlook on the band it's the first time I've you know lived a quote-unquote real life um so yeah it feels like a it's been a massive period of um change and growth and development for all of us um so to be like a week away from release now is I hadn't really stopped and thought about it until the last couple of days we've had like a, a lot of press um kind of catching up in between festivals and and stuff like that and just kind of like starting to talk about the record a bit more it's like wow yeah it is actually coming out now like it's it's done I don't happening think about it anymore you know yeah of course just to just to 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 sort of go back to a point you made a little bit earlier you talked about how this songwriting process is almost entirely different to what you've been used to as a band and how your outlook as a person within that band has changed entirely and also within that, everybody else's lives has changed in the same period of time within the band as well. So can you talk me through the differences between the songwriting process that led to Pathos and how that compares to Maya in a more specific way then? A hundred percent. So like um, the majority of Maya and the EP was like me and Dan sat in my mum's basement eating takeout food and like, writing riffs and just hanging out and it, it kind of like, that's the dream uh, by the way right there yeah, that is the dream it was pretty dope um <laughs> there's a shout out to pizza hot in daventry um oh, superb they uh a lot of our demos were named after spelling mistakes in their <laughs> menu for a little while <laughs> um, there's a song called chicken nuggest which was like <laughs> Kajira, never made it past the uh the demo phase but uh yeah, <laughs> um <laughs> they uh yeah so th- that was kind of our initial vibe and when Yan came on board he got involved in the writing pretty quickly so we were like very after those you know when we started gigging and we were gigging and rehearsing so much again like for the first three years we rehearsed every single week and did multiple shows so we were like hitting it really hard we weren't hanging out as much so we would start writing kind of uh everything was done on guitar pro so we'd send each other tabs and 
you know, get on the phone and chat about ideas and kind of build things that way. And that kind of continued through the whole Maya process. So um, the real benefit that we had with all of that was that we were gigging those songs outside of like Choke and Thankless that were the last two tracks we wrote for the album. Everything else there had been gigged tens if not hundreds of times. Um, so, we, you know, we, we had the right feel for how it was going to work on the record. Um, Pathos, the majority of it, I think we had like It Dwells written before the pandemic or like at least like the bones of it. Um, we couldn't get into a room together. Like I, I was in America for like three months um, just as the pandemic started and was kind of going back and forth seeing my wife and kind of like like we said like having that real life and kind of like really just like was a little bit burnt out on music and touring and everything so um we started writing and again it was remotely and had like a couple of jams before we went to the studio in like November 2020 but really to this day we still haven't played half of the album in a room together like it is it has all been done outside of the live environment which is just so weird to us um yeah like if you look back on a track like Hollow from Maya um there's a video of us playing at Mammoth Fest in like 2016 or 17 um there's like a full set we play hollow and it's like completely different there's a bunch of the same riffs in there but there's yeah loads of different stuff in there after that show we were like this song just isn't really working we dropped it for like six months completely rewrote it and then it made it onto the album like that whole process when you become a quote unquote real band and like can't just play all your stuff all the time mm -hmm. um it has to change so this has been our first time um going through that process and having to write and just how it's gonna go down live um which i think has been um I, I'm really happy with the record. I think that it's going to translate well and the stuff we've been playing live has been been going down really well. Um, but yeah, we, we got into the studio and we were like, we had seven songs and maybe like two of them had lyrics. And then three days into tracking the drums, we decided to uh, add in what became Suffer Alone. And... Um, it was whoever was tracking, the other three would be like sat on laptops writing lyrics and we would write, we'd almost like give ourselves, we had a rough idea of what we wanted all the songs to be and we'd, um, we'd nail down a concept and then the three of us would just write and like write as much as we could about that concept or that idea or we, you know, whatever the song, whatever direction the song was going. And then like like for uh, Basilisk, I had literally like two A4 pages worth of lyrics. It was almost like, almost like an essay going into the whole concept of the song. And then we cut it down and cut it down and cut it down. And it was like this way more of a melting pot than we've ever had. Um, the majority of the lyrics on my one person would be like, hey, I've written most of a song. And like, you know, we'd tweak it and work on it a little bit but um yeah this was way more collaborative and we were writing and recording right up until like 1am on the last day that we had booked oh. to be recording it was like a honestly kind of a stressful process um, it does it does sound it does sound really really stressful was there um and like the way sorry, that we no, work sorry. Being, sorry yeah the way that we work being so like meticulous and like every single note and bar and idea and everything being 
uh, gone over 10 times and, you know, written and rewritten all of this stuff to be having to make those kind of like finite uh, final decisions almost on the spot at times was something that we'd never even considered. And I think ultimately we came out with a really good record, but I don't think any of us want to do that again. Like well, that was, that was... We going back to everything is done before we even look at a studio. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what I was going to ask you about actually, because it sounds like you had to be a little bit more meticulous like you like you said about uh, every single note and especially combining that with the pressure did you enjoy the process of being able to be more critical over your music your lyrics the structure or was that kind of like i don't know some artists you have conversations with artists and it feels like a very cathartic organic experience that this is my art yeah. this is the thing i've produced i want it just as i imagined it in my head and some artists love the the telescopic scientific Let's break this down, break this into little jigsaw pieces and put it back together. Which one for you is a preference? Because it sounds like you've now done a bit of both. Yeah, I, honestly, I hate being in the studio. It's really not my, <laughs> not my preference. Um, and it, like, it kind of comes down to like the other guys in the band are so good. Like they are like incredible musicians. Mm -hmm. um, and there'll be times when I'm tracking something and I'm like, I know that Dan could just play this 10 times better in half the time. And some that like a few times on this record, it got to the point where I'm like, we could waste five hours with me trying to track this bit, or you could just do it now. Like, let's just get this thing done. Um, and it came to that a few times. Um, but yeah, for me, it like my my comfort place with the band is on the road and playing shows and um, you know, that side of things. And for Dan, it's very much in the studio. And I think all of us, we enjoyed the, like getting these songs done. And like, there is no feeling like when you have a track finished and then you get the mix back and it's like, this sounds exactly how like we felt it needed to and and you get that I think for me like cracks in the pyre on the album was something that I was like not worried but we didn't have like a proper demo it was all guitar pro and like kind of threw something together that was still a little bit ramshackle until we like finally heard it I wasn't entirely sure it was gonna work um and like that moment of hearing that song and being like oh no, I think this is my favourite thing we've ever written, was like amazing. Um, and kind of like, I think in terms of process, we will 100% go back to having everything done in advance for the next record. But I also think that like the experience of doing Maya and being so... Uh, like being so green like we had no idea what we were doing like yeah. we submitted the record and the label were like oh this is great have you got artwork a video <laughs> like anything we were like oh no we just did the album like what <laughs> what more do you want um and like going from that to almost feeling like kind of pros at this point um with with this record I think the things that we've learned are that we do not work as well under pressure as we would like. I think there is always a bit of pressure required, like we have to force ourselves to do something, but it needs to have the time to kind of ferment and change and evolve. And I think that's, people talk about like our songwriting taking so long. It's like, yeah, because we'll sit with a song for three months and then go, bar 12 isn't quite right and everyone will go <laughs> I know right it's bar 12 right yeah and then we'll sit and we'll spend four hours like re with a uh, fucking suffer alone and I'm kind of a bit of a tangent but we we were in the studio and um the feedback that Will had given on the record was basically like I think it needs like a fast song we were like well we had this one and Dan's like it's such a shame like it didn't make it onto the record and uh Jan looks up to him and he's like yeah 
yeah, I love that track. It's like, I just annoying we couldn't make it work. And Dan was like, hold on. The only reason it isn't on the record is because you didn't like it. And Jan's like, no, you didn't like it. And then they had that moment, they looked at each other and like, hold on, do we like this song now? And it was like, great, we'll put it on the record. Four days to fix three bars, right? In the, like, there's a middle section in the breakdown where there were these three bars that didn't quite work. I've heard Dan put every single possible note into that guitar profile for those three bars. And eventually, like, what we settled on wasn't, like, perfect. None of us were like, yes, that's the one. It was like, that is as close as we can possibly get to being happy with it. We have to track it now. And it's kind of just, like, grown on us a little bit. But, um, yeah, it, it, it's it's been a an interesting process and I think truthfully the the thing that we mainly learned from it is that we will need to play the stuff and simplify things a little bit more and I think the next record is going to be a focus on um kind of stripping things back because this record feels so maximalist like it's all the notes all the time um it's really difficult like the coming into like playing these songs live it's like fuck we didn't really think about that too much like there was some some parts where dan was like yeah either you're gonna have to do vocals here or you're gonna have to take this guitar line because there's no way both of them are happening um and vice versa and we you know we were conscious of it but the songs are so intense and kind of require a lot of concentration and a lot of focus and it's almost kind of takes away from the enjoyment of playing it um yeah or suddenly performing it in part so i think yeah our main takeaway is that we're just gonna chill a little bit on the next record do you i've got so many questions what you just said yeah, but yeah. I, I was um I'm going to start off by what you what you said most recently. Wait, because you've written in this kind of collaborative, organic kind of way where you're all sort of adding things together and this goes here, has that contributed to the song length and the song complexity and the song dexterity? Whereas you think if you'd have gone in, like you mentioned, with a set 10 tracks, this is how they're saying, this is what we've agreed, this is what we've practised, almost that complexity and dexterity would be not minimalised but reduced somewhat. Is, is, is the songwriting process one of the contributing factors that's led to the song's length and complexity. Because, I mean, every song bar two is over five minutes long and there's six tracks are here that are at six minutes and above. I listened to it today. It took me about an hour and a half and then another hour and a half just to process what I just heard. Um, so how, like you talked about that and talked about having those conversations with Will and sticking a fast song in and all this type of stuff. So how has everything you've described actually contributed to the product itself? Do you expect that to actually change because of your approach moving forward as well that's actually a really great question um i truly i think that regardless of the circumstances um that we put ourselves in when we're writing we would end up with the same product because uh like to an extent like yes i think that your circumstances are going to affect your art regardless of what you're doing. Um, and I think it has had some effect, but I think the biggest um, tenet that we still have as a band is that the four of us have to love what we do and we have to be passionate about a song and a song isn't finished until it feels right. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that approach was still kind of like flowing throughout everything we did. I think the main difference is that we've had seven years of doing this and kind of like experience that just wasn't there when we were writing um, Iron Maya or Vertical Line and Maya, whatever you want to call it. Um, <laughs> Like when when we were writing those songs, like me and Dan were listening to like the Black Dahlia Murder and Gajira and just discovering like Yob and Paul Bearer and Converge and like kind of just broadening our musical, certainly my musical um, 
palette when it came to kind of more extreme music. And like seven years down the line, we've, you know, been touring across the world with so many amazing bands and getting to um, experience just stuff that we never thought we would. Um, and I think that experience has affected the music more than anything else. So like I'm now listening to stuff like Imperial Triumphant and going, how can I, it, it, like before it was like, how do I distill like Black Dahlia Murder and Gajira into my like um, metalcore uh, mindset, which was, you know, what I grew up in and what got me into, yeah. you know, bands like by Valentine and Trivian got me into. Yeah. You, you and me metal. both, brother. That, that generation yeah. is all me as well. Yeah, for sure. So it was like, how do I take music like that's this step up and like filter it and make it make sense to to us? And now, like we're looking at Imperial Triumphant and Oathbreaker and you know far like bands that seven years ago I'd have been like, what is this noise? Like this is this is incomprehensible. <laughs> now I'm looking at that and going. How do we filter that through, you know, our lens and make music that has that kind of intensity and flavor and um, style and make that accessible to us, you know? Um, like, I love Imperial Triumphant, but a full record of that is about all I can take. And it, like, I have to really sit down and be in the mood to go, right, I want to be absolutely beat over the head with intensity yeah. right now and that's not something that I have in me all the time whereas I want Kundra to be the music that I want to hear you know and it, like what we I think what we strive to do is to take all of these ideas from the music that we love across every genre and go how do we distill this into something that ticks 10 out of 10 boxes um and it's it's I think it, that kind of approach hasn't changed from day one I think we've changed as people and I think our influences and our tastes have changed and it's that that shift that I think has affected the the record and why the record feels so different to me is it's just this is the first thing we've written since going through the experience of being a band um and I know that whatever we do next will be informed by the next, you know, two, three, four years of of us getting to go out and do stuff like Tasmania and go, like, I know we're going to travel a lot more on this record for sure. Um, and, yeah, like, it, it would be insane to expect a band that have gone from playing in Corby and hanging out in their mum's basement to like playing in Tasmania and having a real life and like I got married like to be making the same music I was making seven years ago would be laughable and I think the bands that do that and the ones that don't evolve and change as they evolve and change as people you can tell and it, it doesn't feel genuine anymore um, I, I was saying this to someone last night, I was like, whether it takes one year or 10 years for the next Conjurer record, the only thing that we guarantee is that it will be genuine and honest and it will be something that we are passionate about or else we just won't bother releasing it. Like, if we never put out another record again, it's because we couldn't come up with anything good. <laughs> and, like, that'll be it. <laughs> like, game over. <laughs> No, I think I think that's an incredibly admirable thing to say. But I also agree with your ideology there that music should change, music should evolve, mm. and you, you you hear you hear bands, and you can tell you're you're absolutely right. You can tell the amount of times I've had to review an album for a pod, and it's like the twelfth album. And it's like you know, does it sound like album eight? Yeah, what's album fourteen going <laughs> to sound like? Does it sound a bit like album eleven? Isn't it? And, and yeah. you can kind of feel like I could do the review without actually listening to the record, um, but. I wanted to talk to you one more thing about the songwriting stuff because it's just a fascinating topic and you're such a thoughtful, yeah. thoughtful guy. And it sounds like an incredibly thoughtful band. One of the things that really struck me 
about this album was the how easily he seemed to transition from the incredibly and crushingly heavy to just melodic, low key, ambient, clean guitar driven type stuff, and then immediately sort of thrashing back. There are moments where you pause just for the length of a riff, and then it completely shifts gear yeah. and transitions. I'm I'm curious how that actually happens from a all right, we're going to go in and do you write the riff and then think of the breakdown? Do you think of the breakdown and write the riff? Do you think of the clean stuff and then make it heavier? Do you write the heavy stuff and think, oh, it needs something softer? How does this How does this happen? Honestly, a bit of all of the above. And <laughs> this is something that I think is the hardest thing in songwriting is transitions between sections. Like, mm-hmm. I may even just don't bother. They go, and now it's a different riff. Like just <laughs> yeah. in the of that. and everyone's gone. That's fine, um, and yeah. no, no longer. We we refuse to put up with Iron Maiden style changes. Um, <laughs> it's because everything's in A, as you know, of the transition. It's the same chord. Yeah, that is the thing that takes hands down the longest. That and like track sequencing and getting the the songs to flow together in like a really. Um, a way that feels natural because we we don't like write an album we write song 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 and then find a way to make it feel like an album um so in terms of like those transitions and those sections and stuff a lot of times dan will come up with like a like a little clean section or something like the intro to cracks in the pyre he's been like jamming that little clean riff for a while and then finally kind of decided we'd find a way to make it heavy and kind of it all developed from that little intro um other times there will be um we'll be like building tension in a section with like a lot of heaviness and it will it's almost like (laughs) sounds so pretentious but it's the best way i can do to describe it like you imagine someone's drowning and then like that little like gasp for air as they yeah, just like, yeah. like surface and then straight back down into it. Like it gives a song like that little bit of breathing room. And like in terms of like all the acoustic and like, all like clean lead stuff, I think there is such an an emphasis in what we do on light and shade and on um just dynamics in general that it it, like heavy music doesn't feel heavy if it is like full hm2 from song one to song 10 like it it kind of for me all blurs into the background and it's about the the juxtaposition and the um contrast that you create Matt, you are you speaking do. my language as an English teacher over here I'm just <laughs> loving this <laughs> juxtaposition yeah. and contrast and oxymoronic songwriting skill I'm so I'm so into this this is the best thing that's happened all day all I, all I wanted to do at school was English and music like that. that's true <laughs> um but yeah and it it's it's that it's like it's the um trying to make everything feel like a journey and going right this this section is great we love this this section also feels great how do we naturally get from there to there and a lot of it is messing around with that and it becomes more and more difficult like the the breakdown in fact like the whole last like minute and a half of basilisk was um actually from a song that we had like day one that we played at our first show um, called Old Gods is what it was called. And it was like proper like Lovecraftian death metal kind of bullshit, but it had this like outro (laughs) section that we really like. And we've been trying to get that into like a better song for years. And um, it needed a bunch of like shuffling around and everything, but like, finally managed to get it to feel natural into a track and like that was such a huge success story on this record was like getting that part into um into what we do but again it's like we're not just gonna throw it into a song it's gotta feel 
right and it's got to gotta have the you know when you like listen to a a record that you love and you're like that do you make music yourself at I, all? I, I, I used to i play i play four instruments but not as not in the same we're not in the same world all right well um <laughs> there's a a thing that with all the bands that i was in previously you like play your songs and you're like oh this is cool this is how the song goes but it doesn't feel like the only possible way the song could have gone in the way that when you learn like a Metallica song or a Converge song or um, a Gajira song, you're like, oh yeah, this feels natural. This feels like a proper song that I'm learning. And like mm -hmm. all of these riffs relate to each other and they work well. And it feels like this is the only possible way this song could have been written. And until we get that feeling, then the I agree with that. not right. The song's I not done. I think I think in those circumstances, yeah, and it is, it is that, that's the transition. Yeah, I com I complete I completely agree. I think it's a lovely way of putting it. I think I think when you're actually in control of the process, that uncertainty allows all these limitless possibilities. When it's when it's if you learn it into Sandman or something, it's just that's yeah. just how the song goes. Or if listening into yeah. Mastodon, oh, it's like they, they they did that, then they did that, then they did that, and that sounds fucking great, and that's why I really like it. But when it's when it's on you, it's like, well, does this sound great? Is this how I want it to sound? Yeah. I'll go from I'll go from D to E there. Should I put a C chord in? And you know, it's it's that level of uncertainty that creates yeah. all these possibilities. I'm gonna get I'm gonna get you guys out of here on get you out of here on this. But it's been an absolute pleasure, by the way. Um, so you've got um, yeah. you've you've just done Tasmania. You come you've come back down. You're sort of like <laughs> in the midst of several different time zones. What does the rest of 22 look like after July 1st for Kundra? What are you looking forward to? What are you expect to be the highlights of? A, I presume a very busy year. Yeah, I think for me, the highlight is always going to be the, the headline tour at the end of the year. So it's kind of like October, November, UK, Europe. Um, the 2019 headline tour was easily the best thing we've ever done um, and still kind of like blows our mind that people will just come to see us. You know, it's like we're not supporting anyone. Like we're the band. You can all leave now if you want. Um, <laughs> that, that whole... Yeah. Every time we're just like, what the fuck are you doing here? This is nuts. Um, <laughs> you pay for this. It's crazy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but like outside of that, we have a bunch of like, we're doing Hellfest this weekend and um, a bunch of other European festivals, Brutal Assault, Art Tangent in the UK, Radar and Doom Miners in the UK. Like um, just really going out there and, and getting back into, you know, what was normality and then hopefully um more next year like america i think we're gonna do mainland australia um just really get back into the swing of, of being a band and and enjoy playing these songs finally playing some new fucking songs for the first time in <laughs> forever that's that's fantastic i just want to say thank you so much for having um having the time with us yeah. Brady Deep Rose, Conjurer, Conjurer, thank you so very much. And he called you Conjurer there, that's not even a fucking word.